Okay, good morning, gang. Allergies are really acting up today. Um, today we are going to pick up where we left off last time. Last time was one of the most important days in this class because uh, you know we introduced the derivative. Today my goal is to help you guys start understanding the derivative as a function in its own right. And uh, towards doing that, I'm going to do some calculations, but we're also going to look at a lot of graphs. So today is going to be mostly about graphing. Uh, Let's get the screen share here. of Mac 2311, it's a lecture, and today's date is the 22nd. My wife and I just found out this morning that we were approved for a, a house. I think I mentioned to you guys last week that I had to uh, rearrange an office hour because we were going to look at a house. We, we got the house, so we, we just got the letter this morning, so we're very excited about that. Um, but that's perhaps not as exciting as... Um, as getting to graph the derivative of a function for the first time. So uh, today we're going to uh, move to section 2.8, which is understanding the derivative. It's very sweet of you guys as a function. Yeah, it had been quite a process, actually. We were looking at a house in Midtown for about six months, um, but the owner of that company, uh, Meisner Real Estate, uh, took our application money and then just fucked us around, said that there's a heater issue at the house and that they, they you know, can't have people living there. So eventually we just said, fuck them, and started looking at other places. So this place up by Northside worked out. It's going to be very nice. But <clears throat> for our purposes today, this is much more exciting, right? So last time we saw what the derivative was. We did some calculations, but we haven't really talked too much about exploring the interpretations. So hopefully you recall from last time that if I have a function f of x um, and I pick my favorite point a here, um, I can come in <clears throat> and find the equation of the tangent line. All right, so this fellow here was the tangent line. 2f of x at x equals a, where a is just a number. Um, today, uh, and, we, and we saw that as a uh, limit of secant lines. So the slope of the tangent line um, this is where the derivative came in. So that slope sometimes you'll see written as m tan. Um, this is f primed of a, whatever that means. Um, and we said, well, what that means is that's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. All right, that was the idea. Um, and of course, if you want to find the equation of the tangent line, the other thing you need is a point, right? Once you have a point and a slope, you can use your point slope formula to come up with the equation of the tangent line. So the point up here is a comma f of a. 
So if you're not given the y value of that point, you just plug in the x value to the function to get the y value out. Nothing crazy there. That's an old concept. That's a concept from way back in college algebra. But the slope, this is fresh shit, right? Cooking up the slope of a tangent line as, as a limit of this difference quotient, that is very fresh. So that was the big concept for this week, or at least the big concept from Monday and Wednesday. Now today, what we want to do is start exploring this thing as a function of a. I want to see if I move a around, so you take your favorite function f of x, hold that fixed. You imagine all the slopes of all the tangent lines, and then you start graphing those slopes as their own function. What does that look like? So I'm going to show you how to do it visually, which is very important. And I'm going to show you how to, how to get the result out algebraically, which is also very important. But the biggest thing for today is to think about the graphs, OK? So we started doing this one point at a time. Somebody tells you some number a and some function f of x, and you're like, all right, I can find the tangent line to that function at that point. What I want to do now is start imagining all the tangent lines, in particular, all of their slopes. And I want to graph all of their slopes. That will be the graph of the derivative. So this function, this gives rise to a new function called f primed. In fact, we'll usually just call it f primed of x defined um, as above. F primed of x is equal to the slope of the tangent line to f of x or to um, at each x value. All right. In other words, you just swap the a's up here for x's. This is the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Just swap a with x. Uh, now, <clears throat> before I cook one of these up through calculation, um, I want to cook one of these up, or several of these up, just by thinking about graphs, because that's the, the much more important thing to do here. Um, and I want to start with relatively simple examples. <laughs> Any questions we want to ask about the picture, these concepts, notation, anything like that before we move on? What is the point of switching A and X? Can't we just read it the same? You can, yes. It's it's kind of a silly thing. In fact, I've never been a fan of the, the like starting off with this notation. But the, the idea is when we first start talking about derivatives and slopes of tangent lines, we're thinking one point at a time. So we think of A as being a fixed constant. And the step from 2.7 to 2.8 is instead of thinking of this as a fixed constant, I'm going to start thinking of it as a variable that can move around. And we usually use letters towards the start of the alphabet for constants and letters towards the end of the alphabet for variables. That's really all it is. So we're just going to start thinking about this as a variable rather than a fixed constant. Thank you. Yeah, there really is conceptually no difference, no difference at all. And in terms of calculation, no difference. Um, just instead of having a, an actual number here, you're going to have a variable here. All right. So let's look at.
something nice and simple. f of x equals x squared. I'm going to graph this, and I'm going to graph it with a little bit of care. Okay, so I'm paying a little bit of attention to scale here, more than I normally would, um, because the geometry is kind of important. We all know the graph of x squared. It looks like this. And what I want to do is at each one of these points, these like easy to work with points, I want to estimate the slope of the tangent line. So I'm going to come in here. Say, OK, over here. And it looks something like this. Maybe, maybe the slope of the tangent line here is like, I don't know, it's pretty negative, right? It's definitely negative. Um, and it's fairly steep, um, negative 5 or negative 6, something like that. And then by the time I get over here, it's a little bit more shallow. negative four. By the time we're here, it's still negative, but it's not as steep. Um, like negative two or negative one. What about right here? What's the slope of the tangent line at the vertex down there? Zero. Yeah, very good, right? If we draw the tangent line in there, it's pretty clear that this is going to be horizontal. And then by symmetry over here, if this has slope negative 2, then this has to have slope positive 2. This guy would have to have the symmetric slope here. So we'll say that this is an estimate of positive 4. And up here, By symmetry, what did we say over there? Negative six. We'll say this is positive six. So we're estimating the slopes of the tangent line. Now down below, I'm going to draw a graph whose y values come from those slopes. The slope of the tangent line at negative 3 is negative 6. Let me come down here and mark these off. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 1, 2, 3. All right. So down here, this is going to be the graph of f primed. I want you guys to help me out a little. What is f primed of negative 3? Based on our guesses, right? We're just guessing right now when we say approximately. So based on the estimates we made up here, what do we think f primed of negative 3 is? Negative 6. Very good, right? f primed of negative 3 should be the slope of the tangent line to f of x at x equals negative 3. So that's the slope of the tangent line right here, which we said should be negative 6. f primed of negative 2, similarly. Oh, sorry, again, approximately, we're guessing. Should be approximately negative 4. 
f primed of negative one should be approximately negative two. So some points that are on the graph of f prime. Here's negative six, negative five, negative one, negative three, negative two, negative one. Negative three comma negative six, all right? For any function, if the input negative three leads to the output negative six, that means the point negative three comma negative six is on the graph. If the input negative two leads to the output negative four, that means negative two comma negative four should be on the graph. If the input negative one leads to the output negative two, that means that should be on the graph. All righty, um, let's do a few more. We said f primed of zero. We're pretty confident that should be zero. f primed of one should be two. f primed of two should be four. And f primed of three should be six. Should be about up here. So what do we think for the graph of the derivative here? My art is bad and I feel bad, but there's some nice big fat points and we can fix that. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit of a bad art thing. So six, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, six, should really be like way up here. This is two comma four, so I'll label these. So what sort of function do we have graphed here just based on our estimates? Is, there, is everybody comfortable with how I go from this graph to this graph? This is the big thing for today. How do I get this graph from this graph? We just estimated the slopes of the tangent line at each one of the points on the original. And then I built this new function whose y values are the slopes of the tangent line from the original. Is this making sense? Yeah. So a lot of your homework this week, a, a non-trivial portion of those problems are you coming up with this graph given this graph. Um, and I want you guys to do it exactly how I did it here. I want you to go through it on paper. I know you can look in WebAssign and just click. Um, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to go through this process of drawing it. Now, how could we check our work? This looks like a line. Looks like the graph. Um, of a linear function. Maybe, maybe this function, which is f primed of x, is this thing, maybe we did it right. What would that slope be? Well, if this is 0, 0, and 1, 2, this would be 2x. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a reasonable guess based on our work. If I wanted to check that guess, I would need to actually calculate this derivative, right? Well, we know that f primed of x, I'll try to make my primes nice and big because I know sometimes they don't come to my camera, should be the limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h 
minus f of x all divided by h. <clears throat> which is the limit as h goes to zero. f of x plus h, that's x plus h quantity squared minus f of x, that's x squared, all divided by h. I'll continue over here. That's the limit as h goes to zero. Again, good notation is really important. Write your equal signs, write your limits. Don't leave off parentheses, all this shit. Your solutions as you do these calculations should look just like mine. Um, X plus H quantity squared is X squared plus two X H plus H squared. And we're subtracting from that X squared and we're still dividing everything by H plus the X squareds go. This fella and this fella can talk to each other. And the result, is lin h to zero two x h plus h squared. And we can factor out an h Now that can cancel with the H from the bottom. And we get then H to zero, two X plus H. And uh, it's all over one, right? When we cancel that, all right? Cause downstairs here, this upstairs is H times this, downstairs there is H times one. Um, so when you cancel kind of everything from the top to bottom, it just becomes a one there. Um, you don't have to write this, you can just leave it as two X plus H if you want. But the glory is that now that the H is gone from the denominator, you can just plug in zero for H and you get two X plus zero over one, which is just two X. So we were right. F prime of X for this function is two X. Could you plug in like the other, could you plug in like 2x instead of x squared and end up getting the opposite? Your uh -huh. end result would be x squared. Uh, so that's actually a really cool question. Um, is taking the derivative, what's the word for this? Um, like a projection or is it is it something that goes back and forth? No, um, there's a separate operation that takes you from f prime back to f. So if you were to differentiate this again, if we were to take the derivative of this, it would bring us a step lower on the derivative ladder. So you can kind of walk down and you can walk up on this derivative ladder. Um, and their differentiation, you notice here that the degree went down, right? The original function f was a quadratic and the derivative here is linear. If we went on to differentiate this again, to run this function, through this process, we would end up with something uh, one degree less, a constant. And I can show you that by thinking about tangent lines here. So think about at each one of these points, what is the slope of the tangent line? If you wanted to run through this process again, this time using the derivative as the starting function, here the slope of the tangent line is two. Here, the slope of the tangent line is two. In fact, everywhere along here, right? This function has a constant slope. So the derivative of two X, which we would call F double prime, the second derivative of F is just the constant function two. Um, I'll show you something like that in just a second, but yeah, these don't undo each other. There is an operation that goes back in the other direction. The operation that takes you from this back to X squared is called the anti-derivative. Um, and we will study those towards the end of the semester, but they're actually a, a bit more complicated. Uh, where is the x plus h squared? Um, so the function f here is the squaring function. So f of anything is that thing squared. So f of x plus h is x plus h squared. 
because f of x is x squared. Uh, remember how this works. f of dog shit here would be dog shit squared. f of your mom would be your mom squared. f of anything is that thing squared. So f of x plus h is x plus h squared. All right. Um, other questions on this calculation? I'm kind of confused on since it's like f prime x equals, I'm confused at why you wouldn't do the 2x and you did the x squared. What do you mean wouldn't do the 2x? Uh, like, so why? like, Go um, I don't know. It's just, I would think like, since f prime x equals 2x, wouldn't you plug in the 2x into f? f? So we think that f prime of x is 2x. That's our guess based on the graph. What we're doing here is we're checking that guess. This is the definition of f prime, right? Remember from last time? f prime of anything is the limit as h goes to zero f of a plus h minus f of a over h. This is the definition of f prime. So here, I'm, I had a guess. I suspected that f prime of x was 2x. f of x is x squared. And I suspected that the derivative f prime would be 2x. So here I'm checking that guess. I don't know for sure that f prime of x is 2x. That's a guess. I do know for sure that f prime of x is this limit, because this is the limit that defines f prime of x. And the fact that this came out to 2x at the end is a verification that my guess was correct. The formula here doesn't have f prime of x plus h and f prime of x. The formula here just has f of x plus h and f of x. So if you want to calculate the derivative, that's done by taking the limit of this difference quotient, and that difference quotient has the original function in here. Okay, okay, I get it now. Is that making sense? So this right here is the definition of f primed. I don't know what f primed is. I had a guess. I'm hoping that this comes out to two x, um, but the way I calculate f primed is through this definition. And then it, it turned out we were correct. But this is, this is our starting point. This is the only thing we can really trust. Everything else was just a guess. Yeah, it's probably worth saying, right? This is the definition. And the function in here, for sure, is the original function, not the derivative. These are really good questions. I'm, I'm grateful, Robert and Mackenzie. Does anybody else have any other questions? So I want to run through this game one more again with a slightly different function, All right? And uh, yeah, so here, remember, here's our, our definition for f prime. We will be using this on the regular. Um, so there's something a little more interesting. So we're going to say, and you'll have homework questions titled just like this, use the graph of f of x below to sketch the graph of f primed of x. Um, and then we're going to do the same thing, where we kind of try to figure out what that derivative is, uh, we will, uh, and then do the actual calculation. Well, this one's going to be more complicated. Uh, it's going to be more complicated in some ways and simpler in other ways, I guess. I'll just show you. There we go. Nice straight lines. Okay. Pretend like this is a straight line. Here, the original function I'm looking at 
is the absolute value of x. So you know the point up here is 3 comma 3, the point here is 2 comma 2, the point here is 1 comma 1, the point here is negative 1 comma 1, the point here is negative 2 comma 2, and the point here is negative 3 comma 3. What's the slope of the tangent line over here? Here or here. Anybody help me with that? How about right here? What does the slope of the tangent line right here look like? Yeah, negative one, right? And what about right here? Right here? Also negative one? Yeah, those are all negative one, right? In fact, no matter where you looked over here, uh, you know, modulo again, my bad art, right? This should be a straight line. Um, the slope everywhere over here is negative one. And what about up here? One. Good. And here, and here, all one, right? So the slope of the tangent line to this function, everywhere left of zero is negative one, and everywhere to the right of zero is positive one. What happens if we form a graph like that? So let me write out these values again, just like we did before. F primed of negative three, what do we think that is? Negative one. Good, right? F primed of negative three should be the slope of the tangent line to the original function at x equals negative three. That's negative one. And this is the same as f primed of negative two is the same as f primed of negative one. Um, this is the same for all negative x values. And f primed of one, that looked like it was one, right? And tan here at x equals one, is one. And this is the same as f primed of two is the same as f primed of three. All of these are the same for all positive x values. OK, here's a doozy. What about at 0? If we zoom in, is it possible for us to zoom in here and get an idea for the slope of the tangent line at the origin there? Zero? It's an interesting question. Let's look at Desmos. Zero is a reasonable guess. In fact, of all the guesses, zero is the only reasonable one. But Scales are set a little weird. All right. So here's my function, f of x. But no matter how far I zoom in, I can't get to a place where I can like really see the tangent line here. As I come in from the left, the slopes are all negative 1. As I come in from the right, the slopes are all positive 1. But 
In fact, if I just keep zooming in further and further, this thing isn't like smoothing out. I can't see what an actual tangent line there would look like. And it turns out we're going to run into a very real problem here when it comes to trying to define the derivative of this function at zero. So for the moment, I'm going to ignore that issue. I'm going to sketch the graph of f primed everywhere else because the rest of them are easy, right? We know it's going on everywhere x is negative. We know it's going on everywhere x is positive. So here's my x-axis. This is going to be the graph of f primed of x. We said I'll mark off some x values here, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. One, two, three. Uh, down here, I'll mark this as negative one. Down here, I'll mark this as positive one. So we said f primed of negative three is negative one, which means the point negative three comma negative one is on the graph of f primed of x. f primed of negative two and f primed of negative one are also the same. And in fact, we said everywhere over here for all negative x values, I know that the slope of the tangent line to this graph is always negative 1 over here on the left, even at negative 1 half or negative 1 third or negative 1 fourth. But at 0, it's definitely not negative 1. So this is a, an open hole. Now at one, we know the slope of the tangent line is one. At two, the slope of the tangent line is one. At three, the slope of the tangent line is one. At three and a half, two and a half, one and a third, everywhere to the right of zero, the slope of the tangent line is one, even at positive one half and positive one third. But right there at zero, the slope of the tangent line certainly isn't one. So like it is down there, this is also open. Here's your graph of f prime. This is the correct graph. And the natural question is, well, what about at 0? And the answer is f prime does not exist at 0. And what we're getting at is an idea called differentiability. You see, not all functions have derivatives at every point. It's possible for a function like this to have a derivative everywhere over here and everywhere over here, but right at zero here, the derivative fails to exist. Because of the sharp corner, because it is pointy, I cannot say what the slope of the tangent line is there. Zero is a reasonable guess. And there are alternate ways of defining derivatives or derivative-like objects that do exist for this. You kind of take an average of two derivatives as you send the limit in from both sides. Um, but I am going to prove to you that with our definition of the derivative, the derivative for this function does not exist at zero. And that, so this is going to be our guess. Our guess is that f primed of x, the derivative here, is the function graphed above. Who can help me express that function using the piecewise notation? Well, what are the two outputs that this function has? This guy, the guy that's graphed down here. What are the, there's only two outputs, only two y values, right? What are they? Negative, negative one, and positive one. one. Good. So this function is either equal to negative one or positive one. Under what conditions is this function equal to negative one? It's equal to negative one if something is true. X is less than zero. Very good. And it's equal to positive one if X is greater than zero. It's worth noting that the domain here is not all real numbers. 
this thing is undefined if f if x is equal to zero. But this is my guess. I claim that this is the derivative of that function. All right, let's check. We know that f primed of x is equal to the limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. <sighs> We're going to have to consider two separate cases. Right, because this is the function I'm working with is the absolute value function. So this is limit h to zero, absolute value of x plus h minus absolute value of x all over h. All right, because the function in question, f of x, my original function, is the absolute value function. All right, so we're checking the derivative of f of x equals abs x. I think it's this thing above. And I'm going to try to get that out of this. Now, the trick here is when it comes to calculating this limit, I need to work algebra wise with these expressions, the absolute value of x and the absolute value of x plus h. Um, so I need to consider the possibility that x is positive separate from the possibility that x is negative, because the absolute value function is kind of weird. Right? It does different shit for positive function for positive x than it does for negative x. So let's suppose x is positive. So the absolute value of x is just equal to x and limit as h goes to zero, absolute value of x plus h minus absolute value of x over h. That would be the limit as h goes to zero, absolute value of x plus h minus x all over h. I didn't take the absolute values away from x plus h even though I'm assuming x is positive. Because, remember, we have to think of this as a two-sided limit. But if I know that, so how do I say this? If x is positive, is x plus h automatically positive? No, because h could be greater a greater negative number than x. Right. I'm sending h to 0. And that means I have to consider h going to 0 from the left and h going to 0 from the right. But if we assume that x plus h is also positive, and remember, the idea here is we're sending h to 0. So I'm thinking of h as being very, very, very small numbers. I can take h to be smaller than x. So if we assume x plus h is also positive, then the limit above becomes equal to lim h to 0 x plus h minus x all over h. Because if x plus h is positive, then absolute value of x plus h is just x plus h. And now this, the x's cancel. All right, the x's eat each other up. And you just get lim h over h. And those cancel. So you get lim h to 0 of the constant function 1. And that is 1. So if x is positive, 
then it is true that the, the derivative, I should say here, f prime of x, please go back and add this f prime of x. If x is positive, then f prime of x is equal to one. The tricky assumption here that I can replace the absolute value of x plus h by x plus h under the assumption x is positive is, is subtle. It's not obvious. Um, but it's also kosher. It is. Because we're sending h to 0, at some point in this limiting process, as h gets closer and closer and closer to 0, h will become smaller than x. Even if h is negative, it will at some point, as h goes towards 0, become smaller than x. So whether you're talking about the left-hand limit or the right-hand limit here, um, we will be OK. If you suppose x is negative, then f prime of x, again, lim h to 0, abs x plus h minus abs x all over h. We can do the same sort of calculation. Since x is negative, um, and I'll say and x plus h is negative. Same sort of reasoning as above. Since h is going to 0, eventually h will be smaller than x. So x plus h will still be negative, even if h is positive. We'll have lim h to 0 negative x plus h minus, I'm going to write this, negative x all over h, um, because that's what the absolute value function does. If you feed it something negative, it slaps on another negative to make it positive. So the thing that's running in the background here is this definition of absolute value. The absolute value of some stuff, I'll call it u, is equal to negative u if u is less than 0, and positive u if u is greater than or equal to 0. This is what's, what's running in the background here. So now this limit is lim h to 0. Just distribute the negatives. You get negative x minus h plus x all over h. And again, the negative x and the positive x here, they're going to eat each other up, giving you lim h to 0, negative h over h, which is lim h to 0 of negative 1, which is just negative 1. So it's true that for positive values of x, f prime of x is always 1. And for negative values of x, f prime of x is always negative 1. I'm going to go one step further here and show you that f prime of 0 does not exist. And that's the fun shit. I'll hold on to this. I'll give you just a second here if you need to write anything down. Here's our kind of two, two separate calculations under the assumptions that x is positive and x is negative. Because if x is negative, then the absolute value of x is negative x. And if x plus h is negative, the absolute value of x plus h is negative x plus h. All right, so make sure you get this in your notes nice and clear. You can come back and review it later. It's okay if it feels a little bit choppy right now. These are kind of tricky things going on. Ten more seconds here. Oh. 
Okay. Once more, I claim that f prime of zero does not exist. f prime of zero would be the limit as h goes to zero of f of zero plus h minus f of zero all over h, right? If I want to calculate just one point at a time, I can still do that. Just plug zero into the definition. Remember here, f of x is the absolute value of x, all right? So, pause this here. So what is that limit then? That's the limit as h goes to zero, the absolute value of zero plus h minus the absolute value of zero all over h. is the limit as h goes to 0. 0 plus h is just h. So this is the absolute value of h. Absolute value of 0 is 0. h downstairs is h. So this is the limit as h goes to 0. Absolute value of h over h. And you guys have actually seen this limit in your previous homework. it was the signum function, except at zero, it's not defined to be zero. Um, so let me show you what I mean here. I don't know how to take this limit, right? This limit is not clear. So we have to consider left and right limits separately. The limit as h goes to 0 from the right, absolute value of h over h, is the limit as h goes to 0 from the right of h over h. Because if we're going to 0 from the right, h is positive. Right? If h is just to the right of 0, that means h is bigger than 0, means h is positive. So the absolute value of h is just h. And this would be lim h to 0 of 1, which is 1. But if you look at the lim h to 0 from the left, absolute value of h over h, that means h is negative. So we're looking at the lim as h goes to 0 from the left of negative h over h. Again, all of this is leaning on this definition of the absolute value function. All right, so we need to be comfy with that definition. But that's, that's the definition of the absolute value function. It's the line whose slope is negative 1 everywhere to the left of 0, and the line whose slope is positive 1 everywhere to the right of 0. So, like absolute value of x is y equals x, uh, y equals x if x is positive and it's y equals negative x if x is negative. This is just the definition. So now here, you get lim h to 0 minus of negative 1. But that's just a constant again. So this is negative 1. So the left and right limits that define the derivative at 0 are different. So f primed of 0, which would be the limit as h goes to 0 overall, no one-sided bullshit, h, abs h over h, this is a DNE. In other words, f primed of 0 does not exist. And we have a name for this. 
we say that f of x equals absolute value of x is not differentiable. at x equals zero. So our guess was correct. The derivative that we wrote down on the previous page was correct. f prime of x is equal to negative one if x is negative. f prime of x is equal to positive one if x is positive. And f prime of zero does not exist. There's no way we could have defined f prime of zero on that previous page that would have been consistent with the limit definition of the derivative. No matter what we could have tried to choose for f prime of zero, we would have discovered that it contradicts the limit definition of the derivative because the limit definition of the derivative is this. And at x equals zero, right? We've just plugged in x equals zero here. At x equals zero, this limit does not exist because the one-sided limits come out to different things. So you see now why we spent so much time on limits at the beginning of the course. It's not just this tool for calculation, it's this tool for answering existential questions. Does something exist or not? Um, which is you know, meaningful. So I'm gonna zoom out again here just a little bit. I'll give you guys some time. Um, if there are any questions you'd like to ask about this, please, please ask them. So our function here again was absolute value of x. And this is, this is the result for f of x equals absolute value of x. At zero, that limit does not exist. Because the left and right limits are different. Questions on this? Robert? I heard you on mute and I can hear some static, but I cannot hear what you're saying if you're saying something. Is that better? Yes, that is better. Yeah, what's up? On the absolute value of zero plus h up top, where does the zero go? Ah, so I just said, all right, well, what is zero plus h? That's just h. So adding zero to h is the same as just having h on its own. Okay. Yeah, reasonable question, right? Where did these symbols go? Well, this, this one, the absolute value of zero is just zero. And here, the absolute value of zero plus h is the same as just the absolute value of h, because zero plus h is the same as h. So subtracting zero, you just, it turns into nothing. So you right. absolutely yeah, yeah. It's not like I'm combining these. It's just this one on its own is equal to this, and this one on its own is equal to this. Okay. Yeah, fair question. The absolute, the challenge here is that the absolute value is kind of like an impenetrable box as far as algebra is concerned. I can't like add and subtract through absolute values. That's why we have to be so careful here. All right, consider taking a screenshot here. I would, would advise that you double check and make sure your notes are really solid. Here's the, the last page. Again, consider taking a screenshot of this. I'll hold for five seconds if you wanna do that. And then I'm gonna go back to the previous page, four, three, two, of taking a screenshot of this, we have verified that this guess is correct. We have proved that f prime of zero does not exist. So if you want to, you're gonna need, I guess, two screenshots here if you wanna get this whole thing in. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can actually read what's written. Same procedure we went through on that parabola. 
And then here's our graph of F prime. And we're able to verify our guess. Not only is F prime equal to this piecewise function everywhere aside from zero, F prime of zero does not exist. There is nowhere I could fill in the hole here to make this the correct derivative or to extend this derivative. And this is called differentiability. So let me give you a little definition here. Um, and then we're going to do one or two more little fun games like this before we call it a day. So defining the derivative as a function. f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h um, for any x uh, for which this limit exists. If for a given x, the limit defining f primed of x does not exist, We say F is not differentiable there. And differentiability is a big deal. So um, the key word here is. Differentiable. F of X is differentiable at X equals A if the limit defining F prime of A which is lim h to zero f of a plus h minus f of a all over h exists. So just like continuity, differentiability is something that happens one point at a time. We say f of x is differentiable at the number a if the limit defining f prime of a exists. If that limit fails to exist, if that limit is DNE does not exist, then we say f of x is not differentiable at x equals a. And there's a lot of stuff here um, that, that deserves to be talked about very carefully, but this isn't an analysis class. So the amount of, of work I'm going to make you do on this is, is uh, finite um, after given x. If for a given x, the limit defining f prime does not exist, we say f of x is not differentiable there.
so up here, I'm kind of saying, this is how the function f prime of x is defined. It's defined one point at a time through this limit. And if there's any x value for which this limit does not exist, we say f is not differentiable there. Um, so I'm being more clear down here. This is the, the explicit definition of differentiability at a number. We say the function f of x is differentiable at the number x equals a, right? Like x equals zero, x equals one if the limit defining f primed of a, which is this limit, exists. If that limit defining f primed of a, this is an a here, sorry, does not exist, then we say f is not differentiable at x equals a. So this is the, this is the actual definition here. Um, and this can be extended to the idea of being differentiable on an interval. We say f of x is differentiable on the interval i, right? And here i is a symbol that could be replaced by any interval you want, provided. f primed of a exists for every number a in the interval i, right? So if f is differentiable, if this derivative exists at every point of that interval, then we say it's differentiable on the interval. So the, the concept we're defining here is differentiability on an interval. And then we say f is differentiable full stop if it's differentiable everywhere in its domain. So this should be familiar looking. This should kind of feel like the definition of continuity, right? We said f is continuous at x equals a if some limit statement is true at a. And then we said f is continuous on the interval i if that limit statement is true for every number a within the interval i. So you might suspect that there's a theorem connecting differentiability with continuity. And I want you to conjecture about this theorem. We have just a minute or two left in class. We have six minutes left in class, seven minutes left in class. So um, I want to think about this theorem with me for a moment before we, before we state it. Move this up here just a little bit. Here's our function, the absolute value of x. Is this function continuous? Yes. Yeah, it is. It's continuous everywhere, right? The whole graph is one piece. I never need to lift my pen to draw this graph, right? Even here at zero, where it's got some slightly weird behavior, it's still continuous there. If you walk in from the left or walk in from the right, both the left and right limits are zero. And the value of the function at zero is zero, right? The absolute value of zero is zero. This function is continuous everywhere. Is it differentiable everywhere? No. Good. Where is it not differentiable? Zero. Beautiful. You guys are nailing this shit. So this function is continuous everywhere, but it's not differentiable everywhere. So if there's a theorem relating differentiability to continuity, what do you think that theorem might say? It can't, what can it not say? 
what would this be a counterexample to? Not all continuous graphs are um, differentiable. Perfect, very good, right? So the tempting thing, the thing our brain kind of wants us to do, especially because normally when we draw graphs, they're almost always nice and smooth, what we want to say is that continuous functions are differentiable everywhere that they're continuous. If you're continuous, you're differentiable. But it's not true. Right here is a function that is continuous at zero, but not differentiable at zero. So what other sort of statements along those lines might be true? Every differential, I can't say that word, um, graph is continuous, but good. not every continuous graph is differential. Perfect. You got it. You nailed it. That's exactly it. If f of x is differentiable, differentiable, can be differentiated at x equals a, then f of x is continuous at x equals a. Note, the converse is false. It is possible for a function f of x to be continuous at x equals a, but not differentiable at x equals a. This is one of the big theorems in um, the first you know, chunk of real analysis. There's a word in your brain that you can replace the word differentiable with. Smooth. Differentiable means smooth. Continuous means connected, right? We're all used to that. Continuous means you can draw the graph without lifting your pen. We have these complicated limit definitions that we work with when we need to prove things. But we all know in our head that continuous means connected, one piece. Well, differentiable means smooth, not pointy, nice and smooth, no jagged corners. When you zoom in, it gets rounded and it stays rounded no matter how tight you zoom in. That's what differentiable means. Now, is it the same theorem for a discontinuous function as well? Um, so there are a bunch of ways we can read implications, right? So this is a statement of the form A implies B. If you are differentiable, then you must be continuous. Um, what's called the contrapositive to a statement like this is not B implies not A. So it, these are actually logically equivalent. If you are differentiable, then you must be continuous is logically equivalent to saying, if you're not continuous, then you can't possibly be differentiable. And that's true. That is a true statement. So we think about um, it in the forward direction, right? If you are smooth, then you are connected. But it's also true that if you're not connected, there ain't no way you could be smooth. With did differential I can't I still can't say that but um I know like a straight line would obviously be differential but um could like a curved line even though it's not pointy yeah, oh, yeah. okay yep so we saw that was like our first example right the x squared graph this guy is differentiable everywhere he's certainly not straight right but he is smooth so he's curvy but he's smooth. No matter where you zoom in, you won't find any sharp points. 
So a neat fact, and maybe this is, I'll, I'll round up with a few good theorems here. Polynomials. Polynomials are differentiable everywhere. All polynomial functions are differentiable um, at every real number. So polynomial functions are all differentiable everywhere. And they're all nice and smooth, right? You picture the graph of a polynomial, um, they're always nice and smooth. Um, while we're here, sine and cosine are differentiable. At, at every real number. Rational functions, All right? So here I'll give one last thing. Combinations of differentiable functions. Very similar, right? To all of our results on continuity. are differentiable. So if you add two differentiable functions, the result is differentiable. If you multiply two differentiable functions, the result is differentiable. Divide two differentiable functions, as long as the bottom isn't zero, uh, the result is differentiable. And the, the hot one, if you compose two differentiable functions. You plug a differentiable function into a differentiable function, that result will also be differentiable. So combinations, all of the algebraic combinations of smooth functions are smooth. In fact, mathematicians, when we categorize functions, we like to categorize them according to various levels of smoothness. Um, you'll hear mathematicians talk about the set C01. That's the set of all continuous functions on the interval 01. C1 are functions whose first derivative is continuous on the interval 0, 1. C2, 0, 1 are functions whose second derivative are continuous. Um, and we go all the way up to C infinity, where you can differentiate, differentiate infinitely many times. Um, before I let you go, how am I doing on time? 1040. Oh, it's time to let you go. All right. So that's the end of today. Um, most of your homework from 2.8 is graphing, right? So those first two exercises we did where you start with the graph of f and you need to draw the graph of f prime, that's pretty much everything um, besides the, the straight limit um, calculations that we did on Wednesday that is in your homework. So please work hard on those. Um, if you get stuck on anything, you can always come by my office hours or you can take a picture of your work and send it to me. I'd be happy to, uh, to give you a quick reply with a nudge in the right direction. I got to get running. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day. Um, and do not hesitate to reach out if you're stuck on any of the homework. I'm happy to help. Anything urgent before we go? All righty then. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day. A nice, safe weekend. And I'll see you back on Monday. Thanks, Professor. Take care.